Douglas, uh, Robert said, we turn to the theme of <coughs> the life of Abraham this evening. Uh, the last time we met, we looked at the background to Abraham's uh, experience, uh, his origins, and uh, out of the Chaldees in modern Iraq, and his journey from there to Syria uh, and to Haran, uh, the time being around 2000 BC. And his uh, journey thanks response to God's call uh, down to the land of Canaan and uh, God's promise to him that one day he shall be headed that as the promised land. And we saw too that in response to God's call, Abraham uh, turned his back uh, upon his own uh, culture and his own religion and family uh, and set out uh, uh, depending on God's promise uh, without much clarity as to where in fact uh, God will eventually lead. And in some ways, in very many ways, it's a paradigm uh, of our own uh, turning to God in faith and repentance. Tonight, I want to uh, move on uh, beyond that narrative uh, to reflect more closely on the covenant theme uh, as that's uh, brought before us uh, in the story of Abraham. And I want to look at the two uh, uh, inauguration of the covenant, Genesis 15 and Genesis 17, uh, because uh, uh, there are two accounts there, uh, complementary accounts, uh, nevertheless, uh, each one being its own uh, emphasis to as regard to this uh, great covenant issue. Uh, but before I do that, I want to uh, engage in a moment again uh, of background with regard to this idea of the covenant and uh, to make three general points uh, very quickly. Uh, first of all, there is uh, a special Hebrew word for covenant. It's a very simple word, the word berith. And uh, this word berith uh, has a background uh, not in theology as such, uh, but in commerce and also in diplomatic relations. Uh, the Berith was in the first instance a covenant uh, or a contract between uh, two commercial parties uh, in which uh, uh, there were promises, uh, undertakings uh, and stipulations. Uh, and it moved on uh, from that sphere into the diplomatic sphere. Uh, and we know, in fact, that there was a large number of uh, such treaties between uh, various uh, uh, nations and various monarchs in this era. Uh, these are known as ancient Near Eastern treaties. Uh, and these were all called uh, Berith's or Berithim. And uh, those of special interest are those uh, between uh, a conquering king uh, and his conquered vassal. And uh, those uh, treaties from that context of a specific form, uh, there are hundreds of those now extant, uh, and uh, they, have a stip they have, first of all, an introduction uh, or a preamble and then a stipulation, uh, and then a promise. Preamble, stipulation, promise. Uh, and uh, the preamble is uh, uh, to the effect, well, such and such a king uh, stipulates uh, and then promises in the context of stipulation uh, that such and such will happen. Now, the point of importance here is that uh, in these uh, treaties, there was obviously a very, very clear superior, the conquering king, and there was also a vassal, uh, simply acquiesced in the terms laid down uh, by the conquering king. And the God-man covenants uh, are very much uh, of that form. Uh, they're not uh, conflicts between equal parties. Uh, they are uh, sovereign dispositions on the part of God himself. In other words, there are two parties, but they're not equal parties. There is the divine sovereign, and there is the human vassal, uh, the sinful creature. Uh, and in those covenants, uh, 
uh, God always takes the initiative and God lays down his own terms and does so in sovereign grace uh, and in complete freedom. And uh, the Abrahamic covenant is very much in that form uh, where uh, God says who he is uh, and then God lays down his terms. Now it's interesting that when uh, it came to the Bible into Greek, the Old Testament to Greek, way back uh, around the 3rd century BC, uh, there were two Greek words available to the translators. Uh, one was syntheke, one was diatheke. And the syntheke, as in an English word, synthesis, emphasized the togetherness and equality. Now, they avoided that Greek term because they wanted to avoid the impression of uh, uh, and between equals. And so there was the other word, diatheke, which meant uh, much more uh, a sovereign disposition. So we have... Uh, this interesting fact, uh, as so often, that the Bible does not invent new terms uh, to convey its concepts. It finds this beneath word for a content or a treaty already in existence. And it uses that word and this concept uh, to convey uh, those large masses of truth. And the model for us is uh, not the equal party contract, but the sovereign divine disposition imposed uh, by a conquering king uh, on his conquered vassal. I suppose uh, one analogy to that would be uh, the Treaty of Versailles uh, in 1919, uh, where the uh, Allied powers imposed on conquered Germany uh, their own terms. It will have happened. Uh, calamitous consequences, but there was no equal equality in those negotiations. The second point I wanted to make here is that uh, the, 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 these covenants between God and man uh, are covenants of grace in which God takes the initiative uh, and uh, the whole uh, movement uh, originates uh, in the divine love and the divine mercy. There was nothing in Abraham uh, that could in any way earn uh, God's love uh, or merit uh, God's favour. Uh, but God lays down uh, his own uh, gracious and loving arrangements and uh, it all is independent uh, of any merit on, God, on, on Abraham's part. And the third point, which is linked to that is more important to find, is this, that uh, this Abrahamic covenant, this berith that God makes with Abraham, uh, is unchangeable uh, and it's permanent. And I wanted to emphasize that point for a specific reason, and that is that we often draw contrast between uh, the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant. Uh, as the one were a covenant of grace and the other a covenant of law. And you'll find even that some uh, fairly eminent uh, uh, Puritan theologians, in fact, uh, define the Mosaic covenant as a covenant of works. Now, it's a very interesting issue, the relation between the Old and the New Testaments. And this question of how you relate the Abrahamic to the Mosaic Covenant bears very closely on that issue. And the important point is that in Galatians, Paul makes very, very plain that the Mosaic Covenant, which comes 400 years after the Abrahamic, cannot annul or set aside the Abrahamic Covenant. And so he's saying to us, look, there is no way that God, if he set up his church on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant of grace, would then come in with a Mosaic covenant of law or covenant of works. Now, what is important there is to remember that the Mosaic covenant, the Sinaiti covenant, uh, is in fact a subspecies of the Abrahamic covenant of grace. Remember that the decal of the Ten Commandments begins with a statement, I am the Lord your God. It did not say that if you obey me, I'll become the Lord your God. 
but it said, I am, and therefore you will obey me. They did not become God's people by obeying the Decalogue. They weren't redeemed from Egypt because they made the Decalogue. They were redeemed by grace. And the Mosaic Covenant is simply a phase, a temporary phase of the administration uh, of the covenant of grace, the Abrahamic covenant laid down the paradigm, the fundamental terms uh, on which God related uh, to the human race. That goes back to Abraham. And the Mosaic covenant falls under the, the rubric uh, of the Abrahamic. Remember that in Psalm 51, when David confesses a sin, he does not plead for forgiveness on the basis of us having kept the Mosaic or Sinaitic covenant, the ten words, but his appeal is, after thy loving kindness, Lord, have mercy upon me. And there is somebody under the Sinaitic Mosaic covenant uh, who is coming to God for forgiveness and saying, Lord, have mercy on me. It is utterly gracious. There were not different kinds of uh, redemptions, one Abrahamic, one Mosaic. The Abrahamic was the umbrella dominating concept and the Mosaic was set within the framework uh, of that covenant of grace. Well, against that back, let's turn first of all to Genesis uh, and to chapter 15. After this, the word of the Lord, of Yahweh or Jehovah, came to Abraham, to Abraham in a vision. After this. Now, that's interesting because uh, we've seen Abraham's long journey from Ur to Haran and then down to the promised land. And then in verse, in chapter 14, uh, we've had uh, Abraham's uh, uh, wars with the kings uh, of the cities of the plain. And there is a very clear hint here uh, that there's a measure of exhaustion and anticlimax uh, setting in uh, in Abraham's soul, in Abraham's emotional state. It's very similar perhaps to Elijah on Mount Carmel uh, and the collapse into despondency after that great event. Uh, and God is under the juniper tree uh, and is uh, feeling so sorry for himself. Now, after this, bear in mind that God has made him a great promise. God has promised a land, and God has promised him a seed. And neither of those has yet materialised. He has uh, separated from Lot. He has made all those enemies, all those kings, be through them, been through all the hassle of the war. And so now here he is, perhaps in a measure of dejection, and after climax, anticlimax, and then after this, the word of the Lord comes to him. And that follows uh, the announcement to make in clear terms uh, of the covenant. Now, notice first of all the covenant God. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your very uh, great reward. And uh, that's a reminder to him that although he can't see him, and though he fears all those kings, perhaps, nevertheless, there is a shield, an invisible shield, all around him. I am your shield, Abraham, and I am your very great reward. He refused in uh, chapter 14 to accept uh, the spoils of his conquest, but there is still the reward. God himself uh, is uh, his reward. And uh, then later on we see uh, again God coming back uh, to this, uh, this same theme that is the God who come out, uh, of, uh, out of the Chaldees and so we'll see later on perhaps. But the point is here that the covenant God uh, is so uh, enormously important. Uh, and Abraham says to him, uh, O uh, sovereign Lord. And the whole possibility of the covenant promises being fulfilled derive from this fact uh, of the covenant God and the nature uh, of that covenant God because the promises were impossible of fulfilment. They were so unlikely. Uh, 
how could these things possibly come to pass? Either could come to pass because of the nature of the covenant of God. Don't be afraid, Abraham. The years are passing. You're getting older and older. You've got all these difficulties, all these, these setbacks. But still, don't be afraid because I am your shield and I am uh, your uh, very great reward. And then we see the covenant promise. And set again in the context of uh, a measure of a dejection on Abraham's part, O oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? I still have no children. The promise uh, is no nearer to fulfilment uh, than it was those months and indeed uh, those many years ago. There's an out also of rebuke to God, of resentment. Uh, you have given me no children. So a servant in my household uh, will be my heir. And then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. And so God is saying, I know the years shall pass you, but I am the Lord and one day a son from your own body uh, is going to be your heir. And he takes him outside. Now, this is an old man. He's uh, almost 90 years of age by this time. And uh, he says to him, look at the stars, he says. Took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars. And uh, then he said, so shall your offspring be to this childless man. Now, when we think of Abraham's faith, you know, we, we're so familiar with it, like we are with the story of the cross of Calvary, and we see, well, Abraham was a believer, and it's good to be a believer, it's good to have faith, and faith, and faith. But remember what's happening here. This childless old man, whose wife is sterile, uh, he is being told that he will have <coughs> countless progeny. As humorous as the stars in the sky or the sand on uh, the seashore. Look up, he said. Look up at the sky and see. Count the stars if you can count them. And you know, this is not pure spirituality or pure idealism because, in fact, this is what happened at both the physical and the spiritual level. At the physical level, there are all those descendants of Ishmael. And indeed, one of the challenges which came to me today, thinking about this whole section, 1517, is the status of, this, of the Ishmaelites in, God's, in God's, God's purpose and God's providence. Because we've seen it along that they too uh, are heirs of a divine blessing. And part of the fascination of this is the uh, relation between the the Isaac seed and the Ishmael seed in the continuing story uh, of the Middle East. Both groups, in some respects, blessed by God, and yet living now and for so long uh, in such uh, obvious tension. So we have all these physical descendants, but also, of course, uh, the spiritual descendants, uh, a multitude uh, which... Uh, no man can number. And then you read there, you see in, in verse 6, Abraham believed God, believed the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Very familiar words. Abraham believed the Lord. Now the faith of Abraham here was faith in what God had said to him. Faith in the divine revelation. And the revelation said, Abraham, I know you're 90, I know you've no children, but you'll have a seed more numerous than the stars in the sky. And he believed the Lord. And I think the staggering proportions of that faith have to be grasped to understand anything about uh, the, the Abraham narrative. Because how, how was this uh, going to happen. Now go back again to where I started. 
I am your shield and I am your great reward. And it all stemmed from that. But he believed the Lord. The Lord had told him this amazing thing, this impossible thing. And it'll be amplified for us in, in chapter 17. So he believed the Lord. Now, the faith Abraham shows here is quite staggering. It is faith on a mega scale. It's very well to say, yes, that uh, we are uh, Abraham's children by faith and we are the same faith as Abraham. Yes. Do, do you really have the same faith as Abraham? If God made you a promise on this on this scale tonight, would you say to Abraham, okay, Lord, I believe you? Well, yes, we have faith as he had. But it doesn't seem to me to be on the same scale. There's a, there's a heroism here. There's a, there's a difference in scale. A quantum leap in the kind of faith uh, that uh, this man uh, shows. And uh, uh, then the Lord said, uh, to, he says to, to, to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, how can I know? The third point in the chapter, the third moment here, uh, we've seen the covenant God, we've seen the covenant promise, and then there is the covenant ritual. That is the way that the covenant, in fact, uh, is enacted in a very visible and memorable way for Abraham. Bear in mind the question how can I know? He's almost asking here for some. Visible sign guarantee something that is uh, sensible, that he can see and that he can recollect in the objective and external world here. How can I know? And uh, then the Lord gives him all those instructions. Well, you, you know the narrative, but let's go through it for a moment. Bring me a heifer, a, a goat and a, and a ram, and uh, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon and so on. And you know the story here, how Abraham uh, collects all those animals and how he slays them and puts them uh, in two heaps or in two lines. And uh, what we have here is uh, a covenant uh, inauguration uh, ritual. And there are two or three things that, that stand out here. Uh, first of all, the link between the covenant and sacrifice, between covenant and sacrifice, because uh, these are all uh, sacrificial animals. And the covenant here is inaugurated uh, by blood. In fact, the Hebrew phrase for to make a covenant was the phrase to cut a covenant. And that probably referred to this uh, uh, sacrificial aspect, the, the slaying of the animals. You cut the covenant. It was always set uh, in that sacrificial context. Uh, and uh, it meant, in a way, to use her own cliched phrase, that all the benefits of the covenant uh, were, in fact, uh, blood-bought benefits. And we know that in relation to our own Christian faith, uh, this is equally true, the Lord's Supper, those words, this is my blood of the new covenant. So that every blessing that we enjoy uh, is itself the purchase uh, of the blood uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here we have this, this ritual whereby at God's own command, uh, Abraham takes those animals, uh, slays them uh, and arranges them uh, in this peculiar order. And then you notice too the, the, the sense uh, of solemnity we have here. Uh, uh, verse 12, as the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness uh, came over him. And there's a sense of the preternatural here. Not the same as we have with regard to the Sinaiti covenant, and yet in its own way, uh, so very solemn enough, we may say, well, he simply slew the animals, but the taking of life was almost a solemn thing. But here is Abraham, and there is, he is in this, this deep, deep sleep, and there is a dreadful darkness, a preternatural darkness. Uh, that's uh, where he is. Uh, and... Uh, uh, then God tells them uh, something of the future. And part of what's going on here again is that it's such a test of Abraham's faith. When he tells him, you see, 
you, however, uh, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good, at a good old age. And you might think, well, that's good news. Uh, I die in peace and I live to be an old man. But see, before that, uh, what said uh, of his descendants. Now, you see, God has promised him the land and promised to seed the land. And he's been a stranger himself in the promised land. And God says, you descendants to the strangers in a country not their own. And they'll be enslaved and ill-treated 400 years. And again, it's part of the testing. You see, Abraham said, Lord, you said children. I've no children. You said land. I've no land. And God is saying, be patient. And you're asking, well, how long must I be patient? He's been told, well, 400 years. You'll die in peace. And you'll never see the land as your own land. Your descendants will eventually after all those centuries and after all that painful bondage, they will see the land. There is a divine time scale here, which is not our time scale uh, at all. And so often, uh, God's time scale is not our time scale. Abraham is showing signs here of, uh, in the chapter of, of impatience. Lord, what about the children you promised me? What about the land you promised me? And here God is saying, 400 years, 400 years, John, you'll die in peace. But 400 years, and they'll be through all these other trials, but eventually the promise will be fulfilled. And in the fourth generation, he said, your descendants will come back here. In the fourth generation, 400 years down the line, they'll come back here. And this enigmatic phrase, the language we have here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. And there's again a, a curious divine time scale here. The Amorites, uh, in this context, is a collective term uh, for the whole uh, Canaanite nation with all its various tribes. Uh, and it's being said to us for the, uh, the Canaanites uh, has not yet reached uh, its full measure. Now, we'll see uh, shortly, of course, in uh, chapter uh, uh, 18 and 19 that uh, there is an interim punishment on the Canaanites in Abraham's own lifetime, but it's only interim. And in fact, what God is saying here is that that civilization has not yet reached the full maturity of evil. And for his own purposes, God intends to let it reach that maturity of evil. And then it will uh, meet uh, with condign divine punishment. And the intriguing thing is that the inheritance of the promised land by Abraham's seed is linked to the judgment of God upon the Canaanites. And of course, what happens is that uh, in the conquest by Joshua of the promised land, we have a virtual liquidation uh, of the Canaanites. And the two points are linked here, uh, that uh, the, the seed will inherit the promised land, and in that same moment, we'll see God's punishment on the Amorites or on the Canaanites. So again, there's, there's God's time scale. Uh, God sometimes allows evil to develop, allows it to reach its maturity uh, before uh, he exposes it and deals with it uh, for reasons uh, which are often known uh, only to himself. But this time scale, Abraham's faith, all the ways it's been tried, it's been tried by the long delay in a child being born, it's been tried by the fact that he has no, owns nothing in this promised land at all. It's been tried here by, by, by God so making so plain to him. Abraham, you won't see it. Nor will your son, nor grandson, or great grandson. 400 years. And in the meantime, they're going to go through all the horrors uh, of Egyptian bondage. But eventually, and of course beyond that, 
we know that his, it was tried in terms of having to sacrifice Isaac. So this faith that believes the impossible and the incredible also being tested by delay, by the difference in, in God's own time scale. And then we see this uh, climax of this particular narrative uh, from verse 17 downwards, where the sun had set and darkness had fallen. A smoking brazier with a blazing uh, torch appeared and passed between uh, the pieces. Now bear in mind, he has sacrificed all those animals and he has laid them in two piles or two rows. And here he is maybe still in his deep sleep. It's not entirely clear. Uh, but the smoking brazier, well, uh, this is uh, almost certainly uh, a symbol of the divine presence itself. Uh, God coming so often in the form of fire, and of course in the Exodus 2, uh, the pillar of fire by day, the uh, pillar of fire by night, uh, fire and God's presence so closely linked. So here in the symbolism is God himself uh, walking between the two rows uh, of uh, sacrificed animals. It's not entirely certain what the point of that particular symbolism is. Uh, it may be at some levels true that uh, when a covenant was ratified, uh, the party said had a communal meal which is shared together. Mm -hmm. And that may be part of the symbolism here. But probably the consensus the, the, here is that uh, in the ratifying of a covenant and the slaying of the animals, the parties were saying, if I violate or break this covenant, then let there be done to me what was done to those animals. In other words, it was the invocation of a covenant curse. Let what happened to those animals be done to me if I should violate the covenant. Now we may have reservations about, about God entering into such symbolism. But I don't think that our emotional reaction to it should deter us of what may be itself the force of truth. So that uh, God is entering into this ritual and, and, and pledging himself. Uh, and virtually saying, should I violate this covenant? Should I, God, violate it? Then let me suffer the fate, the same fate uh, as those uh, other animals. Now, certainly, uh, it's bold imagery and it's a bold application of it. Uh, but I think it's one uh, that uh, we can certainly uh, argue is very, very plausible. So here we have... Uh, the, the, the covenant inauguration by sacrifice, the blessings uh, achieved or secured by sacrifice. Uh, we have uh, God's uh, testing Abraham's faith by this narrative of what's going to happen between the time of his own life and his inheriting this, this promised land. And then we have this uh, divine, almost a self-imprecation on the part of God. Breach of covenant was a very, very solemn thing. It still is a very, very solemn thing. Yet we so often ourselves uh, violate our covenant between ourselves and God. Uh, of course, we reply in the symbolism to both parties. Which, whichever party broke the covenant exposed himself to the covenant curse. Let there be done to me what was done to those animals. And God is entering into that symbolism. Now, all of this is very, very private. Uh, there are no witnesses whatever to this transaction between God and Abraham. It's all between uh, God and our father Abraham. Uh, there are no uh, other observers, there's no narrative, uh, except what we have in, the, in this chapter here. In chapter 17, we have a very difficult, different situation. We have one were removed from the private uh, into the very uh, very public sphere. Now, here again, 
uh, notice the time scale. It's interesting how the narrator here in the Genesis is so interested in time. Uh, Fifteen one says, after this the word of the Lord came. And 17.1 says, when Abraham was 99 years old. And you know, it's interesting because there's a kind of ticking clock here. We talk of a body clock. Well, here was a man, uh, you, you see how it is. The, the last verse of chapter 16 says, Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. And uh, that birth was uh, born in a way of desperation on Sarah's part and Abraham's part to have a child. Uh, and God has said, no, you don't need, you'll have a child. And God had said that to him, you see, 13 years ago. All those years have gone by. And you may be saying, well, how long will God keep a man waiting? And they were, of course, aging, aging, aging all the time but still there was no sign uh, of either the land or the child because of course these were both uh, intertwined the land and the child uh, these two promises implied uh, each other and still there's no sign of any great haste on God's part Abraham was 99 years old and the Lord appeared to him and that's all, he'd been doing that often enough and now the Lord appears to him again 13 years down the road and said I am God Almighty and here again we are up against the, the, this fundamental idea uh, of the covenant God I am God Almighty I am El Shaddai I am the all sufficient and the all powerful and the omnicompetent God that is who I am now it's worth pausing over that because unless God is a sovereign God, unless God is the omnipotent God, there is no way that God can keep any of his promises. Some of you will know that in America in recent years there's been a movement which is known as open theism. Uh, and in open theism it's argued uh, that God doesn't have total control, but that uh, our human decisions are free decisions uh, that God not only can't control, but God can't predict. So that God never knows what you're going to do. Because your freedom uh, means that you're in this open universe where you can go this way or that way or that other one. And of course they say, but God is so great, God is able to adapt to what you decide and what he decides and you decides and God is keeping you all over the place dealing with all those decisions being taken everywhere every day and dealing with each succeeding emergency because he doesn't know what you're going to do. It's all open because it's up to you to decide. Now, if we have uh, God reduced to that, there's no way that any of God's promises can be fulfilled. Uh, if you think for a moment of all the decisions that went into the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take just one example. The spies coming to Rahab the harlot. What made them so decide? Did that happen by pure accident? How could God promise a Messiah through that line if God weren't in control? I am God Almighty. Uh, every single divine promise, every covenant pledge that God makes depends upon his being in sovereign control. And that's what he's saying here. I am God Almighty. And that would appear in the context here in two directions. First of all, uh, that uh, God was going to give him uh, uh, the whole land of Canaan and God was going to give him uh, all the other nations and conquer them and so on and so forth because God had power over the nations and God had power over uh, the, the birth of a child I am God Almighty I can give you those nations I can give you this land I can give you a child despite your old age because I am God Almighty you see nothing in this covenant depended on God on Abraham. 
There was absolutely nothing this man could do to produce a child. And uh, he's told, your descendants will inherit this land. What do you mean by descendants? There are hundreds of thousands of warriors in this land defending it. I'm alone. I don't have a descendant. I, I, I can't get descendants. And God is saying, I am God Almighty. And if you look at the language that follows here uh, in, this, in the succeeding versions, the, the whole emphasis falls on the divine activity there. I have made you a father of many nations. And then verse 6, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant and so on and so forth. And all the time is God is saying, I will, I will, I will. It is the divine promise. And for every promise we have, that is our guarantee for all the hopes we entertain. We bury our dead. And we look at the inert body. And we say, can our dead rise? I am God Almighty. We preach the gospel to uh, an inattentive and apathetic and hostile generation. And we say, what is the point? I am God Almighty. But Lord, these people are so blind. These people, their hearts are so close to the message. I am God Almighty. God says to me, carry this burden, climb that mountain. Lord, what do you mean I can climb that mountain? I am God Almighty. I can't go through that pain. I am God Almighty. It's all down to this fact. I am uh, God Almighty. And God then says to him, walk before me and be blameless. I will confer my covenant with me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. And here we see for the first time uh, Abraham's own contribution to the covenant. We've seen already, I will make, I will make, I will establish, I am God Almighty. But then Abraham too comes under obligation, uh, walk before me. Live your life in my presence, in my conscious presence. The way Enoch walked with God, you walk before God, knowing every step of the way that God is seeing you and God is watching you and God is with you and God is near you. That is your comfort, that's your deterrent, that's your celebrity, that's your joy. Walk before me, always conscious of being in the presence of God and be, be blameless or uh, be perfect. That is, be wholly consecrated, wholly dedicated. It's not the perfection that involves that we keep all God's commandments perfectly, but it is the idea of a consecrated and a dedicated life. Remember again the words of Abraham Kuyper, the great uh, Dutch 19th century theologian, every inch for Christ. Every moment of every day, every inch of the life dedicated to God. That's the pattern that's imposed on Abraham here. Walk before me and be blameless. Now, that wasn't so that he would earn the promises because the promise had been made already. God has justified him. God has declared him righteous. He's already right with God. He's already an heir of God. God is already a shield. God's his great reward. And it's because he is already right with God that he's not going to be blameless. It's a response to his being redeemed by God. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly Increase your numbers. What do you mean, Lord, increase my numbers? There's nothing to increase. I will increase your numbers. And uh, we see again, as I said, this great emphasis uh, on the covenant God. And then the covenant promises. 
Uh, we've seen them before. They've been reiterated time and again. The promise of the land and the promise of a seed and so on. Uh, but uh, he's saying to him now, and no, you'll be the father of many nations, he says to him. And therefore, there is a change of name. Interesting thing that, again, because we take it so much in our stride, you'll no longer be called Abraham, but you'll be called Abraham, that is, a father of multitudes. And I really think we should hear Abraham saying to God, Lord, for pity's sake, don't make me go out into the village calling myself Abraham, a father of multitudes, when I don't have a single child. I'll be a laughingstock. See, this part of the public dimension of it is the name Abraham's got a new name. Now, you may say, well, uh, as far as the public go, Abraham has simply changed his name. Yeah, but how he's changed his name? Do you know what he's now calling himself, that old guy, almost 100 years old? He's calling himself a father of multitudes. Has he been a single kid, but he still calls himself a father of multitudes? We don't know what Abraham thought. The Bible is into psychoanalysis. But that's, that's where, this, where this man is. God has said, Abraham, you must change your name. You must not call yourself a father of multitudes uh, because that is uh, my plan for you, a father of many nations. Uh, and you'll be very fruitful and, and kings will come from you. Uh, great men will come from you. The, the great succession of Jewish kings, the great succession of Ishmaelite kings, Kings will come from you, Abraham. But Lord, I don't even have one child. Father of multitudes, father of kings, don't even have one child. And I'm a hundred years old. That's where the position that Abraham uh, is finding uh, himself in. Uh, but you see, there's this, there's this new dimension I brought in here. To be God to you and to your seed after you. Uh, that is there, I think, around uh, verse 7. God to you, and to your seed after you. And this will lead again to the whole ordinance uh, of, uh, of circumcision and so on. But the, the promise is now uh, not simply to the individual Abraham, but to Abraham's seed. I will be God uh, to uh, your uh, your seed. Uh, and uh, then God says to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant uh, for generations to come. Uh, and then there's this, the covenant sign, but in there you see uh, from verse 9 downwards the sign uh, of circumcision. So there is a covenant God, there is the covenant promise, and there is the covenant sign uh, circumcision. Now, Again, like the uh, Berith or the covenant concept, circumcision was widely prevalent uh, in the broad and general context uh, of uh, Abraham's day. And it still is, of course, uh, very, very uh, prevalent uh, in many civilizations uh, all over the world, uh, in the Middle East and uh, Central Asia and in Africa. It is a very common thing. So uh, it's not, again, a case of inventing something that's unique. It is a case of taking an existing practice and, if I may say so, baptizing it uh, into, uh, into Christ. And uh, it's a stipulation. This is a sign. Uh, it is an external sign and it is a permanent sign. Uh, Abraham had privately, of course, had that ritual which we saw with, the, with the, uh, the dismembered sacrifice that was objective too, but that all happened between himself and God. But here was something which was uh, external and it was permanent. And I think too we have to allow that uh, because uh, it did affect the procreative organ that it was coming back again to this whole issue of the seed. Uh, a sign uh, 
of the supernatural birth of Isaac, that everything depended on that. Because, you see, this man Abraham, he's almost extinct. He was down to one, just himself. And then God, in his amazing way, gave him a child. Now, it's true, so that's only one child, but from that child, the whole of human history has come, we can say. But the circumcision is a reminder of this supernatural conception and birth uh, of, of Isaac. It is also, in ultimate theological terms, I think, too, a sign of the need to be born again, that we need a new star. So here is the sign that God gives to Abraham and uh, it is to be put uh, on every single uh, uh, member of uh, Abraham's uh, household uh, himself and uh, uh, all the uh, other members and of course also on Ishmael. Ishmael too. With whom the covenant is not made but still Ishmael is to be circumcised, and uh, uh, those who are not your offspring, whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. And so the divine ordinance is that every single male in Abraham's line must be circumcised. The one peculiarity of Abrahamic circumcision is that it was an ordinance for eight-day-old babies. Uh, The the common practice was and is that uh, when men reach puberty, when men get married, then they're circumcised. It's a rite of passage uh, into maturity and adulthood. But here's something quite different. It is done, you see, to the unconsenting and to the unconscious child who contributes nothing, but there is a divine promise standing over him. I will be God to this child. And the the paradox of it is, of course, that this was not limited to the elect child any more than it was limited to the born again. God did not say to Abraham, circumcise all the born again or circumcise all the believers but God said to Abraham circumcise everyone who is physically your seed that's what God said and the paradox is of course that not only Jacob but Esau is circumcised and it's not because of our comprehension we understand well Lord why do you ask me to circumcise Esau that wild man who sold his birthright you, you told me that circumcision was a sign that you were God to this child. In what sense were you God to Esau? In what sense? And yet you told me, put the sign of the covenant on Esau. Why did you tell me that? So often we don't understand, but that's what God was doing here. So we have the covenant God, the covenant promise, and we have also the covenant sign. And then God clarifies the covenant promise in this intriguing way from verse 15 downwards. God also said to Abraham, Sarah, Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah, Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. Uh, I will uh, bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. And she is as old as Abraham himself. Abraham fell face down, laughed, and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Don't be ridiculous, he's saying to God. Now, of course, we don't know the whole psychological package here. Is he, uh, is he just overwhelmed by it all? Is he overborne by it all? Or is he being irreverent? 
you feel you should laugh in God's presence and maybe you know situations where people have said something and you've laughed and people say, don't you dare laugh. They're highly offended because you laugh. Don't laugh at me. Don't laugh at me. God doesn't seem to respond to Abraham in that way. He doesn't say to him, don't you dare laugh at me. He doesn't say that to him at all. Abraham fell face down, laughed and said to himself, will a son be born? And uh, Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael uh, might live under your blessing. I have a son, Lord. And ski that Abraham loved him, loved Ishmael. And he says, well, there's Ishmael. And yes, Lord, I would love it if you were to bless Ishmael. And I think we tend to forget Ishmael and the whole of that uh, Middle Eastern, uh, near, near Eastern uh, racial mix that we have uh, still causing us uh, so many, so many problems, and we might, we tend to imagine. You see that Ishmael is just like Esau cursed, but that note is not struck here uh, with regard to Ishmael at all. If only Ishmael might live under your blessing, then God said yes. But your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call uh, him Isaac. Uh, and he says, As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful, and greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of many, of twelve rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. And I just trying to see where this fits in, this, this, this idea that Israel's neighbours of Ishmaelite descent are not under the divine curse. Now the curse, the blessing here is entirely temporal, secular. He's going to be fruitful, going to be a great nation, going to be powerful and so on. But still this fact of the divine blessing, to say the very least, it does not warrant uh, any contempt uh, for uh, Israel's neighbours. They, they are not at all beyond the range uh, of the divine blessing. Bear in mind today, for example, that, in, in that the Palestinian population contains uh, a large number uh, of Christian believers. So here, Ishmael, not cursed. I will bless him. But, verse uh, 20, uh, down there, verse uh, uh, 21, the new models are getting too small for my eyes, but I think it's verse 21. Uh, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac. He said, bless Ishmael. But my covenant is not with Ishmael. My covenant is with the miracle child, with the wonder child, with the impossible child. My covenant is with the child who can't be, can't be. That's the one my covenant is with. I am God Almighty. The child you don't have, the child you can't have, my covenant uh, is with him. And uh, I am going to establish with Isaac whom Sarah will bear to you by this time uh, next year. And then uh, God uh, went from him. And uh, it is, of course, one of the great moments in human history. This divine promise, with its ramifications on tonight's news, and yesterday's and tomorrow's news, still reverberating uh, down through the centuries. Uh, God's blessing uh, of Isaac. Uh, one point I didn't dig up when looking at uh, Genesis 15 with regard to that episode with the sacrifices was that moment when the birds of prey come uh, and threaten to devour the sacrifice and Abraham drives them away. And I think it's fair comment to suggest uh, that this reminds us of the many evil forces, destructive forces, that have always hovered uh, 
over Israel. And they're deterred by Abraham, driven away by him in what sense? That Abraham's faith and the promise made to that faith is still a protection uh, of the Jewish people. There are levels at which I hold no brief for them. Because they're sinners, they're selfish, they're sometimes stupid, mm-hmm. militaristic, all of these things. There are levels at which you could say, well, they're not particularly attractive. And God told them that time and again in the Old Testament. You're nothing special, except that I've made you special. And the birds of prey come, and Abraham drives them away. There's a, a moment, I think, in the life of uh, Frederick the Great when he asks one of his uh, religious courtiers for some proof. Is there any proof that God exists? The Jews, my Lord, after those thousands of years, all those birds of prey. They're still there. And of course, since Frederick the Great, we've had the Holocaust and the massing of all Israel's current enemies, and still Israel and the Jews survives. How that relates to the Pauline emphasis that there's neither Jew nor Greek is another question. But it is a fact. It is a simple, historical, uh, ethnic, ethnographic fact. The Jews are still there. That's simply the way it is. What you attach to that by way of significance is another question. They're there, and that they're there is a miracle. The most hated nation on earth, but they're still there. Still there. And they're still a pivotal uh, to, to human history. And then we see there in, in verse 23. And this again brings out Abraham's character. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household or bought with his money every maid in his household and circumcised them as God told. Abraham always obeyed immediately. We see that when we come to the story of Abraham offering up Isaac. As soon as God tells him, sacrifice your son, off he goes. There's no but God, no why God, no delays at all, but right off he goes. So here, on that very day. When, I don't know how you'd feel on the day that you'd been told that you'd be uh, have a family as numerous as stars in the sky. You would breed kings and uh, the whole of this would evolve around you. But whoever excited he was, this guy who'd laughed, he immediately does what God told him and his faith is shown in his obedience uh, as much as it's shown in a credence uh, that he extended towards the divine revelation. On that very day, he goes and he obeys. Simple homiletical point. How often do we ourselves defer? Lord, give me a minute, another week, another year, uh, before we act. And, you know, tonight I'm sure there is somebody here who knows very well what God wants them or her to do, and yet pretends not to know, not quite sure, not quite clear. I need more light, more guidance, more clarity. You know perfectly well what God wants you to do. On that very day, on this very day, he went and did what what God uh, told him. And then... In case you'd forgotten, and I doubt if you have, because you've heard it so often tonight, Abraham 
was 99 years old when he was circumcised. And his son Ishmael was 13, and they were both circumcised on that same day. 99 years old. And God is saying to you, don't you forget it. And if you're ever faced with a situation where uh, only God can give the answer and only God can solve the problem, remember Abraham was 99 years old. The two, there are two pivotal facts in this narrative. One is this. Abraham was 99 years old. And the other was I am God Almighty. And these were the only two relevant factors at the end of the day. Well, I think that that will suffice for the moment. Uh, uh, it's perhaps not been as lucid as I might have wanted, uh, but the narrative itself is fairly complex. If there are points you want to raise, I'll do my best to try to respond to them.